In this video for Hatshepsut, we'll be having a look at the way Hatshepsut uh, presented herself in imagery. That's both in the reliefs that she had uh, carved, but uh, particularly in the statuary that we have of Hatshepsut as well. This is the first video where we'll just be looking at those images. Uh, we have another video that follows on directly from this, and that we'll be having a look at uh, the historian's interpretations of that imagery, which is just as important, so make sure you watch that video as well. So we're going to start with Hatshepsut and the way she presented herself as a queen, and we've covered this before, so I'll make this nice and quick. Again, the vulture headdress, the traditional trappings of a queen, she's wearing that in this scene where she's standing behind um, Thutmose II, which was customary and, and very much normal during this time period, uh, in an offering scene to Amun. We also have the fact that Hatshepsut commissioned and had produced for herself a queenly tomb and a queenly sarcophagus. Uh, this is the, the sarcophagus here. With the, It's a bit broken, but we see that she's wearing that vulture headdress, the traditional regalia of a, uh, of a queen. So nothing out of the ordinary within the expectations of a, of a queen consort. The only unusual stele we have is uh, this one where Hatshepsut is standing behind Thutmose II, which is customary, but we have Amo, her mother in the scene, who is not Thutmose II's mother. And she's referred to in this as King's mother. Um, however, Thutmose II um, is not her son. So it's an unusual one because the only one in that scene that, that is her, her um, progeny is Hatshepsut. Um, so it's a bit difficult for historians to interpret this one. It may suggest that Hatshepsut had some kind of claim to the throne, um, but that's only one interpretation of it. It's just worth pointing out that it is unusual. Um, moving on to her kingly images, uh, a term we need to learn is called pharaonic regalia, and this refers to the trappings that a king would wear. So, for example, uh, the, the false beard, the shendit kilt, the neem's headdress, uh, all of those are considered pharaonic regalia, and it's a good term to use to sort of sum up what Hatshepsut is wearing uh, when she's depicting herself as a king. Uh, early historians labelled Hatshepsut as a cross-dresser. They thought that she had to dress as a male all the time. Uh, that's been very much let go in the modern sense. Uh, modern Egyptologists don't subscribe to that, uh, that understanding anymore. Um, it, it's now pretty well regarded that Hatshepsut didn't dress as a male all the time. She had to depict herself as a male in, uh, in the scenes because she was a king, and there was no other way that a, a female could show herself to be a king unless she was wearing this pharaonic regalia. Uh, depicting yourself wearing what a king wore, um, because we need to remember that most people at the time uh, were not literate, so this was the way that you presented yourself as a king, by wearing what a king wore. So moving on to some examples of how Hatshepsut depicted herself, and all of these examples are from Dero Bari, all of these statues are from Dero Bari. So we have the Hatshepsut here wearing in, the, in what's called the pink granite statue, and this is a really interesting one, because she's here wearing the Neem's headdress, but uh, and she has a very feminine appearance, so she, she's not hiding the fact that she's female uh, in her facial uh, expression or her facial appearance here, and we don't see her hiding that facial, uh, that, that sort of feminine appearance in her facial features at all in any of her statues. Um, uh, however, in this one, she's actually dressed as a woman. So she's wearing the Neem's headdress, which is the, what a king would wear as a symbol of power of a king. It wasn't a crown, but it was a symbol of, of kingly power. However, everything else she's wearing is as, uh, as what a female would wear. And we also see here that she's not hiding the fact that she has breasts in this image at all. Uh, so it's very much a feminine uh, portrait of Hatshepsut. Another example we have here is the colossal striding statue, called so because she's it's very large and also because she's mid-stride. Um, in this statue. In this one she's wearing that full pharaonic regalia. Um, she also has a far more masculine appearance if you can compare the way her body is depicted here with that pink granite statue. It is far more masculine in this image. And she's also wearing the full trappings, the full pharaonic regalia, wearing the Neem's headdress, the false beard, and the shendid kilt. Um, so very much depicting herself as a man. However, her face is still feminine. She's still depicting herself with that, those soft, more feminine facial features. Another image from Dero Bari is the warrior pharaoh Sphinx. This was just one other way that he's, uh, that um, ancient Egyptian kings could portray uh, portray themselves as the warrior pharaoh Sphinx. The other way, or another way, is in that uh, the scene where they're in a chariot uh, with the bow and arrow and all those sorts of things, the blue war crown. That's one way of d displaying yourself as a warrior pharaoh. Another is through the warrior pharaoh Sphinx, which is how Hatshepsut portrayed herself as a warrior pharaoh. So we see this is a very traditional scene. She's wearing the Neem's headdress and the false beard, which is what's expected for this scene. Uh, but she still retains those, those feminine facial features. Another scene we have here is what's called the formal granite statue. Um, it's a traditional offering scene to Amun. And we can see in this scene that she's 
uh, depicted very much as a male king wearing that full pharaonic regalia, the shindered kilt, the neem's headdress, the false beard, uh, and probably a more masculine body if we can compare that to the uh, pink granite statue, uh, but retaining again those um, those feminine facial features. So that's an overview of the way she presented herself in, this, in these images. It's not comprehensive, but it gives you a bit of an idea. And the next video will have a look at the way the historians have interpreted um, the way she's portrayed herself.